Wow, what a show we have for you today. Okay, I'm gonna open up by talking about something that affects all of us, antibiotic resistance. Why in the world are we all becoming resistant to antibiotics working in our body? I'll close the show with a little headline that said, foods that kill, right? But in between is what you're gonna love. We have Dr. Ken Hunter here from the University of Nevada School of Medicine. Dr. Hunter is an immunologist, pathologist, lots of credentials, and he's going to talk about something I took this morning and I'll take tomorrow morning, and I've been doing this for years. It's called beta-glucan. So Frank Jordan is here, and his son Mark is also here. All that, and I assure you, a whole lot more sandwiched into this half hour. The show is called Know the Cause. This show is brought to you by the NSC Company. When you can't, Beta Glue can. My name is Doug Kaufman. For the past 40 years, I've dedicated my life and even my career to finding the root cause of disease. Join me and a team of physicians, pharmacists, and scientists. And soon you too will know the cause. Hey friends, we need to talk about something. It'll just take four or five minutes, but it's something real, something that's gonna affect you, your family, your loved ones, your kids and grandkids. And that is we are truly beginning to resist antibiotics. Oh, you could see this coming. This isn't a surprise at all. In 1952, we actually had a pill that worked for something in medicine. It cured something. People who, when they were jacking up the car and the car fell on their hand and they bled and, and you know, they would have died from bacteria from that car that got into their body. But they didn't anymore because they went on antibiotics truly hailed as a breakthrough. But here's what I want you to understand. The mold is called penicillium. The poison it makes is called penicillin. Now thank God it's a poison. It kills tiny organisms in tiny doses. So bacteria are tiny organisms. But you put somebody on antibiotics for year after year after year, you're talking about killing a bigger organism. Okay, so just be careful. Let's talk about antibiotic resistance. Truly we face a scary situation, antibiotic resistance so high, modern medicine could be undermined, says Infectious Disease Journal. Center for Disease Control, Tom uh, Fryden. Tom Fryden. Uh, this, uh, this is an important guy. 600,000 individuals receive cancer chemotherapy every year in the US alone, and that devastates our immune system for a period, uh, putting them at risk for neutropenia, low white count, uh, and infections. In other words, they need antibiotics. Th this is a good guy, folks. He's, he's, once again, their brains are programmed differently. Um, he believes, since 600,000 people a year are being treated for cancer, um, that we're running out of antibiotics should they get in trouble. And he's right on that. Well, how did we get in this mess? Okay, just bear with me. This was so easy to predict, as I wrote. <laughs> Uh, we finally had a drug that could cure a medical problem. You didn't need to be a genius to see that it would be overused. No harm in overusing it, is there? Folks, that's the attitude today of many doctors. Well, you know what? You're running a fever. You have a high blood count. I took some blood. You got an infection. And he never says, let's differentiate it. Is it bacterial? Is it viral, protozoal? Is it a fungal? We're just putting you on antibiotic because when he went to medical school, there was 10,000 antibiotics, there were 100 antivirals, and there were six antifungals. So what do you think the medical schools, being financed very often by the pharmaceutical industry, want to teach the doctor? You don't want to sell six antifungals or 12 of them. You want to sell thousands and thousands of antibiotics. So every infection becomes bacterial. But let me reteach. Some of the medical people that are watching right now. That same fever can be induced by fungus. That same elevated white count is induced by fungus as the body's immune system fights. You know, just, it doesn't fight another cell. It's not autoimmunity. It fights the pathogen, the bacteria, the fungus in the bloodstream. All doctors, not true, not the ones I've trained, 99% of doctors would say, oh, any infection, give it an antibiotic. What's the downside of that, doc? Let's keep going. <clears throat> if you, okay, this is big, but I'm gonna tell you what this says. It comes out of a guy named Vincent Bruno. I followed his work, smart guy. Infectious disease uh, chil in children, November 2016. Let me just, okay, good, put that back on me. 
in a test tube. We call this in vitro. Tests inside a body are called in vivo, V-I-V-O. In vitro tests outside of the body. In a test tube, if you co-incubate Staphylococcus aureus bacteria and fungus, and then you try and treat the staph with the drug of last hope, vancomycin, an antibiotic, it doesn't work. You have created a resistant form of staph infection that even vancomycin won't kill. Why is that important? Something in that fungus keeps that staph infection in the little vial, keeps it from, from being killable with an antibiotic. Here's Doug's take-home thought for today. If we continue to throw antibiotics at every infection, as we are, I don't think the brakes are gonna go on it. Medicine's a $3 trillion business. Why put a brake on that? If we continue, if we as patients continue to walk in and say, yeah, I think I got a, I need an antibiotic. Oh, okay, here you go. We're going to create not only resistant bacteria, we are now learning we're going to create resistant fungi, so antifungals won't work anymore either. Be careful out there, folks. The doctors I don't think are gonna change, so it's time for us to really put our smart hats on in a doctor's office. You know, I kind of stretch before I work out. I might do 15 push-ups or something like that. Daniel says it's equally important after you work out. Watch this. Hello, Know the Cause Nation. I'm Daniel Crouch here with your Lifestyle Moment. So we are talking to Doug earlier, and he asked the question, if you had one stretch, just one stretch per day, what would your stretch be? And I thought, hmm, what would my one stretch be? And then it hit me. I'm gonna stretch my hip flexors because a tight hip flexor is the cause of a weak or overextended lower back. And since 85% of Americans claim to have a lower back issue at some point in time in their life, I must speculate it's because a lot of them are really having weak hip flexor joints, hip flexor muscles. So how do you stretch the hip flexor? Well. Let's do it in layman's terms. Remember your, your uh, Little League picture where you're sitting in this position here, and if you weren't Little League, maybe you had a child, or maybe you've just seen a Little League picture, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and let my body, my, my weight rest upon my front knee, and then I'm just gonna let my weight kind of flow this way like so, and I'm gonna feel the stretch right here, right here, right here on my hip flexor. Now I breathe in, and then I'm gonna take all the toxicity that I've just collected, and I'm gonna blow it out. All the while, I'm stretching my hip flexor. Let me show you from a side angle here. So I inhale, and then I breathe out as I stretch right here. So it's almost kind of like I'm a bow and arrow, like this. My body, my upper body is a bow and arrow. So I'm stretching here, the hip flexor, and you will immediately feel this because it feels so good. Now one thing you want to focus on is just make sure your right butt cheek is turned on, and you'll feel it, ooh, that feels kind of nice. It protects the hip flexor here. So I'm breathing in, I'm turning my butt cheek on, and then I'm exhaling as I stretch right here. Now, if you wanna add a little bit more to it, you just go ahead and take your opposite shoulder and try to touch the floor. So I'm taking the opposite hand here, okay, and I'm just touching the floor. Oh. Opposite hand here, and I'm touching the floor with it like so, and I get an even better stretch right here. Oh, man. Oh, pardon me that moment of, of self-reflection where I actually stretch my own hip flexor. It feels so incredibly good. It doesn't take but a minute, and it's gonna be super effective if you've just gotten out of a long car ride or you've been sitting down at the desk all day, or if you just wanna be overall better posture and health. Take this tip, run with it, make it your own. Cannot wait to see you again next time. I'm Daniel Crouch for Know the Cause Lifestyle Moment. Wish I looked like that. Okay, we're gonna go to a commercial, then Jenny's gonna be here, and by the way, the show is only half over. Lots more to come. Nurse Jenny Herbacek up now, talking about biofilms and colorectal cancer, and then we've got a treat for you. Dr. Ken Hunter, Frank Jordan, and his son Mark are all gonna talk about, ouch, inflammation. <music> I'm Jenny Herbacek with The Cancer Connection. Biofilms are turning out to have an important connection with colorectal cancer. These films are made of microorganisms, a slimy substance, and they act as an invisible cloak that cancer cells can use to hide themselves in from the immune system. A study that came out in 2014 found a definite association between biofilms and colorectal cancer. 
Systemic enzymes can be a great tool for cancer prevention and breaking down those biofilms. They should be taken orally on an empty stomach away from food because then they don't have to do the job of digestion and they can do some important housekeeping. Not only do systemic enzymes target the biofilm, but they're anti-inflammatory and they can reduce the stickiness of your blood. They're sold as a dietary supplement at your local store. Check with your integrative health professional or provider for dosing on this therapy. For Know the Cause, I'm Jenny Herbacek. I wish I had more time with these guys. This is a big three, Beta Glucan, the NSC company. This is Dr. Ken Hunter, who is a microbiologist, and immunologist at the uh, University of Reno uh, School of Medicine, uh, Nevada, University of Nevada in Reno. And then Frank Jordan, and then Mark Campbell. Uh, boy, where do I start? Inflammation, ouch, it hurts. We've been beating this drum for 20 years, and yet thanks to Dr. Hunter, we're now beginning to understand when you swallow a beta-glucan where it lands and how it will probably help with that inflammatory response. So do tell what you've discovered here. Well, Doug, it's, it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive. Um, you would think that this material, which for, for decades was, uh, was promoted as having pro-inflammatory activity, uh, which it definitely does have, and the notion of using beta-glucan to stimulate uh, an inflammatory response that would help get rid of pathogens, that's, that's great, and it, we know that it does that, and the original research on beta-glucan focused on that. But it always bothered me over the years that um, uh, beta-glucan caused inflammation. Inflammation is, is a very negative thing for a wide variety of diseases, from from cancer to heart disease to, to even Alzheimer's disease. And recently, we have found, we and, and, and our colleagues in, in other universities have found that beta-glucan, while it stimulates inflammation, it very shortly after doing that, down-regulates that effect with an anti-inflammatory response, thus bringing inflammation down and creating a level of homeostasis. So imagine that you have a, 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 a low-level inflammatory process going on. Uh, Beta-glucan is, is introduced into the system. Beta-glucan is actually pro-inflammatory, triggers a short increase in inflammation, which then triggers the body's own anti-inflammatory processes and shuts the whole system off. So we're very excited about that component of beta-glucan, and, uh, and we, as I said, we and others in other universities are, are, um, are excited about continuing research along those lines. Mark, how, how much information in the past 15, 20 years has your company gotten, and how has it changed your company from Dr. Hunter, information from Dr. Hunter? Well, it, it's truly evolved our organization. You know, originally we had a material that we knew had some positive aspects with it and characteristics that were beneficial, uh, but at the same time we really didn't know where to take it. And and with with the university's assistance and, and guidance as a result of our research projects with them, we have not only f discovered new ways to, to manufacture beta-glucan, but also ways to apply it to, to improve uh, general health and so you know not only is it uh, uh, ideal for nutritional supplementation but we're seeing areas of application that can truly change people's lives it's, it's exciting me, uh, the old adage if you're a newspaper reporter how what why where and right. when that's research folks that's your whole program and you go into it looking at these things we knew certain things but so much has come about uh, the where, the when, uh, the how, all those, we're a long way down the road that we weren't there 20 years ago. Uh, I have a suitcase full, I brought all our studies, it's about this thick, uh, very nice photos on the front, and then some of the biggest words you've ever seen inside. But what it means for you is a better way to address what you don't want in your body and what you don't want happening in your life. Uh, Dr. Donald Corot used to say aging is the sum total of life's negative events. Mm -hmm. And he was really, he was really right. And John Diamond would say, minimize your negative events in health in your life. Every time you have one, at some point, it will re come back 
to haunt you sometime later. He said that over and over and over. So diet, moderate exercise, do these things. Adequate sleep, uh, stress reduction to the point possible. You have meditation, prayer, all these things. So remember these things. But research is knowledge. And from knowledge, you have to have wisdom. Show you where the light switch is, tell you what it does. Guess who's got to turn it on and off? You do. That's right. You do have it. to swallow the capsule. And by the way, if you're a brand new viewer, that comes to you free, right? There's 10 or a dozen in here of the beta glucan. You don't even pay postage. You guys are amazing together. Thank you for the work you continue to do. Thank you. Wonderful work. When you can't, beta glue can. I know that some of you enjoy a glass of wine or a drink from time to time, and here's what I want to do, not judge you, certainly. What I want to do is try and teach you quickly what that is. You see, the fungus is called brewer's yeast. The byproduct, or the poison it makes, is called alcohol. So if you drink, don't drink a lot, drink a little bit. And then before you go to bed at night, some cooked spinach, the green chlorophyll, should help sop up the mycotoxins that are now left in the tummy. You know, it was probably the late 1970s. I'm a dinosaur. I've been around a long, long time. Uh, I got back from Vietnam. I was sick. I kind of figured out what went wrong with me. But it was in the late 1970s when I was just beginning to fully understand the role of fungus in ill health. Maybe early 1980s when I befriended a guy, and his name was Robert Adkins. He was in New York. What a nice, nice man he was. And at breakfast one morning, uh, and he followed his diet. I said, man, you really are on your diet. And he says, I'm so proud of it, I named it after myself, the Adkins diet. Wonderful guy. Um, I've decided after decades of calling my diet the phase one or phase two diet to call it the Kaufman diet. I am proud of this diet. Uh, when I follow it myself, like you, I feel like a million bucks. Oh, I fall off the wagon like everybody does. But the question comes up so many times, how was it developed? What did you do to develop this diet? Number one, I went to Vietnam. I was covered with moisture all the time. Our socks, you guys who are in the war, our socks had to be peeled off us. They were those green socks. Uh, and sores would be under there because we were always wet during the monsoons, and then we dry out and you try and change clothes every six months or something. Miserable, you're covered with fungus when you came home. That fungus made me sick. We didn't have Google searches in 1971, 72. What we had was library cards. So I went to the library and once I figured out, that's right, every time I drink beer, and I was 21 years old when I got back, what's a 21 year old's diet? Beer, cookies, bologna sandwiches, that was my diet, right? That's what my roommates and I had in our apartment there. And I noticed Dr. Everett Hughes at USC said, is it something you're eating? I was getting into food allergy understanding at that time, immunology. And I said, you know, I think when I drink, I feel worse. So he said, well, there are probably other foods too. So I got a library card at USC where I was working, went to the library and began studying after hours parasitology. I felt like a worm had gotten in my body. Then I learned these fungus are parasites. You know, when Dr. Anne Louise Gittleman talking about guess what came to dinner, the worms, the, the flukes, or the big tapeworms in your body, what I hope she knows is fungus is also a, a parasite. It lives off us. It parasitizes us. So along came this Kaufman diet. I began to see what fungus needs to thrive. A 1945 medical book from Duke University talked about in order to starve candida from your body, you've got to cut back on carbs. Okay, I'm 21 years old, what's a carb? So I had to really delve in and start studying what carbohydrates were, their sugars in our body, uh, what they consist of, how can I feel better by changing my diet? I knew beer made me sick, so that was left for my roommates, right? What I didn't know, folks, is grains when you masticate, and then you swallow. What mastication is all about is mixing your saliva, the enzymes, with the food. Then you swallow. Take the digestive enzymes down to break it down, right? That makes total sense to me. What I didn't know is sugar, glucose, is the end result of you chewing up and swallowing the wheat sandwich, the cookies, uh, the corn, the oats. Carbohydrates, these foods are carbohydrates that convert to glucose in your body. There are other kinds of sugars also. 
The Kaufman diet is a diet I developed to minimize feeding fungus in your body. I don't think some of us have it. I think a whole lot of us have it. I think heart disease and diabetes and cancer are linked to fungus. I think a lot of us, maybe the majority of us, have a fungal condition. How will you know? Try the Kaufman diet. It's on my website. Uh, just pull it off free. It's in any of my books. Try it for two to three weeks. That will answer your question that all of you have watching this right now. I wonder if I have a fungal condition. In three weeks, if you feel like you felt when you were 10, 11, 12 years old, all that energy really feeling good, the hips not hurting anymore, the headache pain is gone, the arthritis is clearing up, the bowels are working, you may have had a fungal condition that you are now successfully starving by using the Kaufman diet. There's two phases, uh, real strict and then a little bit more liberal. Many people go back to the phase one Kaufman diet uh, if they don't feel well on the second phase of it. So I'm glad you now know that. Not all natural sweeteners are created equal. In fact, some of them are just as unhealthy as the high fructose corn syrup and refined sugar you're trying to avoid. Take agave, for example. Agave is actually fructose that is processed into a syrup or liquid similar to high fructose corn syrup. And by similar, I mean that it features every bit as much fructose as high fructose corn syrup, if not more so in some instances. In fact, agave is almost entirely fructose. Sure, it's more pure than high fructose corn syrup, but it's still a processed fructose that absolutely impacts blood sugar and insulin levels in dangerous and unhealthy ways. And while palm sugar is natural and unrefined, it has calories like any carbohydrate. So if you're trying to lose weight, I would avoid that too. If you want a sweetener, stevia is hands down the healthiest choice, especially if you have diabetes, because it won't spike insulin. In fact, studies show that stevia may actually improve blood sugar control and help lower blood pressure. Stevia is also credited with anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral properties. So when opting for a sweetener, I only use stevia. There are other natural non-chloric sweeteners coming to market soon, so stay tuned. I'm Dr. Fred Pescatore. This is Know the Cause. You know, I was just sitting here thinking about when Frank and I first met, you know, maybe 20 years ago, and he told me this story, and he couldn't even complete the sentence. His mom got in the car, he was driving her home, his mom grabbed his arm on the steering wheel and said, honey, I have cancer, help me. And Frank wasn't even in the medical field. And he goes on to tell the story about how his studies began uh, with what might be able to help cancer patients, right? Immunity helps cancer patients. Immunity, making them stronger. And that's what beta-glucan does. Now today we talked with Dr. Hunter and Mark and Frank about inflammation, about swelling. Well, what is that lump? When you can feel the lump in the breast or under the arm, you know, what is that? It's inflammation. So this is why Frank has taken this on. It's a passion of his. He'll send you this free. We talk about this all the time on Know the Cause. If you've never gotten this, it's a dozen of the NSC uh, 100s. That's the big milligram strength. Here they all are. This is the caprylic acid and the one next to it in the middle, the green one, is the one I take every day. And then the blue one is the NSC uh, 24, the three milligram uh, beta-glucan. Whether it's the green one or the blue one, do start taking that every day and take it free on Frank. He even pays for shipping. Thank you, Dr. Ken Hunter. Thank you, doc, uh, nurse Jenny Herbacha. Thank you, Frank and Mark, for being here today. Folks, if there's one supplement you wanna lean on heavily for your immune system, it's called beta-glucan. God bless you guys, I'll see you next time.